So hi everyone, uh, I'm uh, Clément Lesage and I'm working at Kleros, uh, which is a dispute resolution protocol. And I've also done some uh, smart contract auditing. So today we're gonna speak about uh, two kinds of risks, technological risk, so mainly uh, programming risk, and also economic risk. Uh, what can happen uh, in protocol, which even if the code is executing as expected, uh, can have uh, adverse uh, consequences. So let's first start with technological risks. And uh, let's start with, I would say, the beginning uh, of, um, of smart contract uh, acts. So you had this uh, project, which was called the DAO. It was really early stage. Um, we did not even have user interface. People were interacting with the blockchain uh, via command line. So that was really um, made not by the general public, uh, but, but by technology enthusiasts. We generally knew uh, approximately at least uh, what they were doing. So these people they had the idea of making a decentralized investment fund, uh, which was called the DAO. And for that, they raised uh, uh, money in, uh, in ETH. And the idea was that if you put money in the DAO, you will get some token of the DAO. And this will give you some voting right into what investment the DAO will make. And this will also give you a reward, uh, like a share of profit or a share of other benefits uh, that the DAO could uh, acquire. Uh, when designing this DAO, uh, they had the problem, uh, which was the problem of the majority robbing the minority. Uh, so we get a, a lot of ease. Why couldn't 51% of the DAO token holder coordinate to just say we invested in uh, in existing project, which is just giving back the money to the 51%. So the idea would be to steal the money of the 49% uh, by the 51% which can coordinate. So to avoid that, when they uh, created the DAO, they added the possibility of splitting. So if a proposal uh, passed and you're against the proposal, you have the possibility to exit the DAO with your share of the funds and with your share of the reward. So initially, that was an additional security features uh, which was made. Um, the problem is that there was some um, uh, programming mistakes because if you were to split, you would have the fund move to a new DAO that now you control. Then you would be called. So this means you could perform some other action. And then your DAO tokens uh, would be burned. So I think uh, we can like here see where the problem comes. Uh, here I, I put it like in simple terms, uh, but obviously that was a bit deep in the code. So not a lot of people could uh, understand uh, the problem here is if you want to attack this, uh, what you do, you ask to split. So you have uh, your funds, your share of the fund, which are moving to the new door that you're gonna control. And then you are called again. So now you have the opportunity to take another action. And you're just going to split again because your fund, your token are not burnt yet. So you split again and more funds are, are, are uh, sent into the new data that you control and you're called again. And so you split again. And at the end, you will have ended up having way more funds into your new data that you control uh, compared to the amount of token that uh, will be burned. Actually, you can, you could have taken all the money in the DAO just uh, by yourself, even if you had just one token. Um, so unfortunately, someone found it, uh, while the DAO already had the equivalent of uh, $1 billion of uh, asset under management, and he stole one third of the asset uh, of the DAO, so which was equivalent to $0.3 uh, billion, uh, which is quite a high amount. Um, <clears throat> what happened is Dakar only took one third of the fund, and why not take everything? Like he, you, you take 0 0.3 billion, why not just take the remaining? Um, the idea was probably uh, to kind of like decrease the attention he will get. Obviously he would have gotten a lot of attention, but less than if he had stolen everything. And he was also scared about the possibility uh, of, uh, of forking that we're gonna um, talk about later. And you had a team of White Hat, uh, which used the same exploit to take all the remaining funds to be sure you would not have another hacker taking uh, the 0.7 billion uh, remaining. 
And uh, so that's the real currency. Um, then you had a community, uh, huge community discussion on what to do. Uh, you had one side which was stating that code is low. So if the smart contract code allow you to take some money, well, you are just using a smart contract code. You are uh, behaving according to the law. The law might be stupid, but it's not forbidden to take advantage of stupid laws. So that was one side uh, of, the, of the community. Um, and this was even, uh, they even have more argument uh, because people, when they invested in the DAO, uh, the contract, uh, the term and condition that they had was <clears throat> that what is stipulated in the code uh, has to prevail compared to uh, the description of the mechanism. So the mechanism was saying, okay, this, this DAO is doing that, but if there is a discrepancy between the mechanism and the code, the code should prevail. And here, the code was allowing anyone to, to steal all the money. Um, another argument was that Bayes layer should be agnostic. Uh, we should not uh, modify the Bayes layer uh, to fix problems which can happen on the top layer. So here you have the Bayes layer, you have SIM, which executes smart contract. In the SIM uh, perspective, everything is executed as it should be executed. Uh, someone made a, a, bad, uh, a bad contract, but that's not the problem of SIM. The same way, if you have an application which is crashing, uh, that's not the problem of Windows. Like you should, you should not update all the Windows in the world uh, to make the application which is crashing not crash. That's the, that's the problem of people who made an application which was crashing. Um, another argument that uh, they advance is that it will lead to legal risk for developers of, uh, of, of SIM. Like we don't want to have the possibility to uh, change uh, what uh, are the balance uh, on uh, on the chain? Uh, because then, if we do that, uh, well, uh, people losing money may sue us, or may sue us either if we change it, or they may also sue us if we don't, uh, stating that we should have uh, helped them to recover the losses uh, when they were a victim uh, of uh, abuse, hack, or fraud. Uh, you had another uh, side, which uh, was the side of the early stage exception. Um, the amount of money which was stolen was way too much, and it would not be good to have uh, such a high amount of uh, ease to be uh, in the hand of some hacker. Uh, that the chain should be user friendly, uh, and obviously, if because there is a small mistake in the code, uh, people uh, lose or can lose one billion dollars. That's not really user friendly, uh, and also to avoid uh, triggering regulators. Uh, if uh, like all the headlines are one billion dollars stolen in a blockchain system, uh, that will obviously have uh, trigger a lot of eyes of regulation uh, that uh, they would not want it uh, at uh, this early stage of the ecosystem, in uh, which could stifle uh, innovation. Uh, so finally, uh, the side of uh, the early stage exception won. Uh, so they developed uh, a, a patch to uh, reimburse. So basically, to take the money from the hacker and give it back to people uh, who had put money into the DAO. Um, this was not only done by a uh, developer of the same platform, but this was also by a consensus mechanism uh, where user and miner could choose which uh, state of the world they would prefer, and most people choose the state of the world uh, where the hack didn't happen and people were reimbursed. However, even if they had the majority, uh, you still had the side of code is low, which uh, disagreed uh, with, uh, with this change and which was saying that the phone should actually belong to the hacker because they just use code uh, the way uh, it was written and it's not illegal to, uh, to take advantage of bad code. And uh, what they did, they, they made a fork, uh, which is now SRM Classic. So now you have two versions of Ethereum. Uh, obviously, the main one has, is the one with more traction, but you still have a, a small community of, uh, of people who believe that code is low, uh, who are uh, running and maintaining an alternate version of SIM, which is now SIM Classic. Um, so we've seen uh, one example of vulnerability, which was the uh, but this is just an example. You have obviously a lot of things to take uh, in mind where you are developing smart contract or when you are looking at smart contract, uh, a common problem uh, will be overflow. So you can see on the bottom, one image which uh, gets you an idea of what is the overflow is when you attain the maximum value, uh, you come back to zero. Uh, so that can be particularly problematic uh, if uh, 
you withdraw more money than you have so that you should have negative uh, a really high negative amount this really high negative amount may be uh, more negative than what the computer can handle and ended up into zero so it ended up making you at a balance of zero uh, which is acceptable and so you could withdraw some money you don't have uh, that's something which can happen in smart contract uh, you have problem uh, of denial of service uh, sometimes you have smart contract uh, which give people the opportunity to take some action uh, when they are executed. And sometimes if no one takes the action, uh, the execution cannot be made. So if you rely on someone and someone just can, can just not take a, a, any action forever uh, and block the, the normal execution of the contract, uh, you have some issue of uh, manipulating storage where uh, you could uh, write some data, normally you should write it on those, uh, on those uh, memory slots, but you may have very long data, which may spill out on a new spa, but also on some other variable, uh, which can uh, like change uh, the state of the smart contract in some unexpected manner, which can also lead to some uh, hack. Um, you have all the problem with um, the gas metering. Um, an example would be you make a contract which um, at some point, it's going to pay all the users of the contract. Well, if you have too much user, uh, it's going to take you way too much gas to pay everyone, and it's not possible anymore. So all the phones will get stuck uh, because an operation will become uh, too long to be executed. Uh, so you will also have the hacking like that uh, happening. Um, some um, also problematic about um, uh, ordering dependency. Uh, so on a... Um, a non-vulnerable application, no matter the order, some action are executed, you should get the same result. But you have some action where uh, green plus blue are going to get some uh, sort of dark cyan, but blue plus green are going to lead to some sort of violet. So depending on the order uh, transactions are executed, you may have different results. And the problem is that before a transaction is executed, people can know it's going to be executed. So for example, uh, you want to sell a lot of, uh, of an asset. Uh, someone could sell this asset just before you, uh, and then you will end up uh, selling the asset at a higher price, and you will end up paying, a, uh, you will end up selling an asset at a higher price, and you will end up getting a lower price uh, because he already uh, took uh, all the buy order, uh, and uh, that's what the problem of front running. Some people can know what you're doing, and they may sometimes react and uh, may have the action been uh, executed uh, uh, before you. Um, yeah, that's an example with front loading. Uh, I think uh, one uh, something which is executed all the time for now is uh, arbitrage, where you have someone buying an asset on a platform, selling it at another platform where the price is higher. Uh, well, you have some people who are just watching all the transaction on the chain. And if they can find out that the transaction is profitable, uh, they may just do it uh, themselves and have it uh, done before you. And that's also problematic because uh, people are, who are doing the work of finding the arbitrage opportunities uh, end up uh, not getting the money and people making use but with front front that end up being getting the money. Um, another example, which, uh, which also happened is signature reuse. Sometimes you sign to, uh, to allow some specific operation and some smart contracts which are not programmed correctly uh, can uh, allow people to reuse your signature in another context. Or even sometimes you have, uh, you, from one signature, you can create another signature which is also valid. And so you can sign, you can effectuate, you can um, do two actions while only one action was signed. So you also have this kind of, of issue. Um, another uh, problematic to keep in mind is that everything on the chain uh, is public. Uh, so there is no private information on chain. Uh, even if uh, some variables are supposed to be private, uh, everyone can read them if they use the appropriate uh, tool. So some people may make some information on chain, believe this information would be private because it's called a private variable, so why not? Uh, but actually everyone can read it. Uh, so this can lead to a loss of privacy, uh, or even sometimes to uh, monetary loss uh, because uh, sensi sensitive information 
uh, such as value similar to password uh, being put on chain and read uh, by malicious party and executed by malicious parties. So yeah, if you put something private, you won't be able to see it, but anyone with a bit uh, more technology advanced then you will still be able to see it. Uh, so that was to give you a small overview of all the kind of stuff uh, which can go wrong from a smart contract perspective. Obviously, this is not exhaustive because otherwise it would have taken the whole talk. Uh, but what you should remember of that is that there is a lot of way a smart contract uh, can go wrong. Um, so how do you avoid smart contract uh, going wrong? Uh, you have uh, what uh, we call the RAB methodology, uh, review, audit, and bounties. Um, and also sometimes automatic test. So automatic tools, they are still quite early stage, but you have companies which are developing tools to warn developers uh, of potential bugs in their contracts. So those tools are getting better and better. Uh, however, at the current stage, uh, you have uh, a lot of what we call false positive. So the tool may tell you uh, there is 10 potential vulnerability in your contract, and maybe, uh, only maybe, one of them may be a real vulnerability. Uh, the other uh, would have been uh, falsely detected uh, by the tool. And you also have false uh, negative uh, when uh, some vulnerabilities are not uh, found by, uh, by these tools. So they can slightly help. They may end up catching, I don't know, like 5 to 10% of the bugs. But uh, it's not the, the panacea, and uh, you cannot really rely on that if you want to make smart contracts, which uh, hold significant amount of assets. Um, then you have some internal reviews, uh, where the idea is basically you are a software company, uh, you get a team of maybe five, six people, and you ask everyone to review the contract. Like one, one guy is going to write the contract, five other developers are going to review the contract, and they're going to do back and forth uh, trying to find vulnerability in it. So this tends to be quite low cost compared to alternative. Um, reviewers, they have a good knowledge uh, of the system, so they, they are often good reviewers. Uh, but the problem is that it has low convincibility uh, to other actors. So if I tell you I developed the system and all my team has reviewed it uh, three times each, well, I can have done that, but I may just be running out of money in my startup and uh, saying that uh, to convince you to use my product, even if I, I haven't done the security procedure properly. Uh, so the problem is that it can convince internal team that their contract is probably correct, but it cannot convince users that the contract are probably correct uh, because uh, you have a conflict of interest uh, between uh, releasing a product fast uh, and uh, and making sure the product uh, are uh, actually uh, bug free. And uh, different companies have different uh, uh, ethics uh, about that. Uh, then you have the audits, uh, where uh, you don't get this problem. Uh, audit companies are external, uh, they're going to get paid the same, uh, no matter uh, what they say about your code. Actually, sometimes they are even paid more if they find vulnerabilities, so they tend to have incentive to find the vulnerabilities. Uh, the problem is that it tends to be a really high cost, uh, because the amount of people who are uh, able uh, to audit uh, those kind of system uh, is not uh, high enough compared to the demand of uh, audits. Uh, so you have a market imbalance, uh, which is leading to a really high cost of auditing. And a uh, large project can pay good security audits, uh, but uh, some small startup uh, may not have uh, the, the fund uh, to, to pay all those expensive audits. Um, the last uh, tool for security uh, are bounties, uh, which tend to have an intermediate cost. So the idea is to say, okay, uh, here I have a contract. Uh, now, if you break it, I give you ten thousand or one hundred thousand uh, dollars. So Bounty can 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 go quite high, and uh, that's permissionless work, uh, which means that anyone uh, anyone on the on the world on the earth can look at the code, try to find a bug, and if they find a bug, they're going to be paid uh, by the company which uh, sets it up the the Bounty. Um, so that's quite effective tool. Uh, because uh, you don't need uh, much money to, to put it compared to audits. Um, and it's also, it's also going to convince other people. Uh, if uh, people know that if a bug is found, someone could get $100,000, for example, um, they would probably think, okay, that's not, if there is a bug, it's not that easy. 
uh, otherwise someone would have already found it and would have already claimed the bounty. Uh, so that's also a really uh, effective uh, mechanism uh, to ensure uh, that uh, that smart contracts are bug free, uh, even if it doesn't rely on a uh, on specific authority to, to validate the contract is good or not. It just, well, if you, if you manage to break it, you, you get paid and you have a lot of, uh, of hackers which may be professional or, uh, or just uh, hobbyists which may look at this contract and uh, find vulnerabilities and get paid for it. And if you don't put bug bounty, as uh, one anonymous guy in the internet say, every smart contract is its own bug bounty program uh, because if you have a contract uh, with a significant amount of money in it, uh, well, anyone which can hack the contract can get this significant amount of money in it. Uh, some people have ethical issues or maybe risk averse and not do it, but you also have a, a bunch of people out there uh, who, um, if they can get some money on the internet and have really low chance of getting caught, uh, they're going to do it and they often do it. Uh, and that's why we, we get a lot of, of drama when uh, you get a hack happening in the ecosystem. Um, something to keep in mind for companies uh, using uh, audits and, uh, and bounties. Um, I think in general, uh, auditing companies are well paid, but we often see companies putting bounties, uh, which are uh, really low value. Uh, but for bounty hunting to be uh, lucrative activities, um, bounty should be quite high because when bounty hunters review a contract, most of the time they are not paid. They are only paid when they find a vulnerability. So the vulnerability which are paid to them should actually cover their costs for all the contracts they are reviewing and not finding any vulnerabilities. Uh, so maybe one advice is pay your bounty hunter very well. And if you don't pay your bounty hunter very well, well, that's just going to be a bounty, but only for malicious actors. Um, another issue sometimes we see in the space is what I would call vulnerability over classification. Uh, so here you can see that uh, uh, the image of uh, uh, the, the boy who cried wolf uh, fable. So it's a boy uh, who has some uh, sheep, and uh, one day he wants to trick the village. He goes to the village and he says, wolf, wolf, wolf. And then all the villagers go out uh, with weapons and they try to chase the wolf, but he lied, there were no wolf. Uh, and they say, hey, I, I got you. But another day, now there is actually the real wolf and he goes to the village and he, he cried wolf, 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 but then no one believes him and the wolf uh, eat his ships and he ends up uh, being uh, uh, homeless because of, of losing his, uh, his way of living. Uh, that's also a bit uh, some, uh, similar which can happen in the ecosystem. You sometimes uh, see uh, actors which are going to classify everything as a vulnerability. And if everything is a vulnerability, this actually dilutes the attention of people uh, to what are uh, real vulnerabilities. So we should be uh, conservative into saying something is a vulnerability uh, because otherwise we, we take attention from uh, legit, uh, legit problems. Um, you can see some examples. Um, still on uh, coding practice, uh, what can lead to vulnerability is over-engineering. Uh, the more complex your contract is, the more vulnerability, uh, the, the higher the likelihood of vulnerability uh, can be in the contract. Uh, each line of code, uh, when you, you make a contract, you should look at each line of code. Uh, is the protection of this line of code uh, greater or lower than the additional risk of writing more code? Uh, because the more code you write, the more vulnerability you can have, but also the more complex it is uh, for your security team uh, to catch vulnerability uh, because they have way more stuff to uh, review and there are way more uh, potential of interaction between different parts of the code. So really um, system which are really secure, they tend to be really simple. Uh, like uh, uh, the amount of line of code of a contract uh, is a good heuristic of its security. The lowest amount of line of code, uh, the most secure it generally tend to be. And yeah, in people with like over engineering, they can make a lot of tests, uh, which can never hurt. Um, also, on the way people are uh, designing smart contracts, uh, they should uh, sometimes think about the mode of failure. Uh, you, you don't want to think about it. Uh, you, you expect your contract will not fail, uh, but good engineering practice uh, will uh, require uh, developers to make their contract fail graciously, uh, or at least the most graciously possible. 
and to limit uh, the damage in case some particular part of the contract uh, would uh, would fail. So you have uh, other kind of problem with smart contract, which are not in terms of smart contract code, but which can be in terms of smart contract usage. Uh, so people who can use smart contract, and now you, you get, it's still mainly obese, but uh, the set of obese is, is getting uh, uh, greater and greater. Uh, and sometimes people do stupid stuff. Uh, for example, transferring some money to some non-existing account. Uh, and yeah, you have to keep in mind you're on the blockchain. Uh, if you uh, mess up with a transfer, you cannot call the bank to, to cancel it. Uh, if something is done, it's definitely done. Uh, we've seen at the beginning of the talk, uh, K, uh, one case where uh, the chain was modified uh, to kind of like fix a problem, but it was like a $1 billion problem for the regular user. Uh, that's, people are not gonna fix the chain uh, when they make some, uh, some, uh, some mistake. And sometimes we see a trend of people making smart contracts, which would uh, prevent stupid mistake. Uh, I also don't think it's the right approach. Uh, I think you should, on the smart contract, only prevent from malicious action, so from hacker, from people taking advantage of the contract. But then you should have good graphical interface, uh, which should protect from stupid action. So typically, a stupid action could be transfer my token to the address zero, uh, which, which happens when people forget to, to put an address. Uh, that should not be the goal of the smart contract to prevent the transfer to address zero, but it should be the goal of the interface to say, oh, you are doing something which seems a bit stupid there. Well, you don't need to say stupid, but you see the point. Uh, do you really want to transfer this token to the address zero? And then the user will realize that he's doing a mistake and uh, not uh, do this action. So user protection also uh, uh, in, uh, includes making good graphical interface, uh, which can pamper the user a bit. Uh, and uh, give him warning if he's doing something which are generally not a good idea. So on this first part, we saw uh, smart contract risk. Uh, now the second part of the talk will, uh, will be about uh, economic risk, uh, where even when the contract are uh, executed as, uh, as expected, uh, you may have the system uh, which uh, can lose some people money. Uh, on that, we're gonna look at uh, automated market maker, um, because a lot of uh, elements uh, of DeFi uh, rely on that. So an automated market maker is a, a smart contract, which is going to automatically buy or sell some sort of assets. Um, user can often deposit those assets, and so they provide liquidity. This means they are both buyer and seller. So here, you deposit token A and token B, and it means you, you always buy and sell token A and token B, and why would you do that? You can do that to get uh, to get the spread. Basically, you buy them at a price lower than you sell them, uh, assuming the price uh, of the uh, assuming the relative price of asset A to asset B uh, stay more or less uh, constant. Um, however, uh, what can happen is if one asset uh, ends up being uh, way more valuable or way less valuable than the other, uh, people who are providing liquidity uh, can get what we call impermanent loss. Uh, so the term impermanent loss is a quite bad term because the loss is actually permanent. Uh, and this is due to the fact that if one asset price goes up, people are going to buy this asset. So because you are providing, let's say you provide 100 of token A and 100 of token B, uh, if token A becomes more valuable, uh, they're going to buy token A from you, and you may end up with 50 uh, token A and uh, 200 token B. But this token may have a value lower compared to holding 100 token A and 100 token B. So this is impermanent loss um, that users sometimes may, uh, uh, not, uh, may disregard. So providing liquidity, you gain the, the spread, but you lose if prices are changing too much. Uh, and that can lead to uh, some uh, loss of a fund of liquidity provider, which may not have understood exactly uh, the kind of contract uh, they were getting themselves into. Um, so uh, that's an example where you had the DAI, which is a stable coin, so something really stable. It's almost always worth around $1. And uh, a fork 
of a, of a, of a non-project, uh, which was really speculative. So you could say, okay, if I deposit 98 DAI and uh, two of these fork token, uh, I have a, I have I have a pool uh, with, with this token, and that should be a pretty stable pool uh, because 98 percent of the token I deposited uh, are stable, and only two percent of the token are speculative. Uh, however, it's not always the case. Uh, so, for example, now if you have this speculative token which has this price dropping to zero. Uh, you may end up uh, as a liquidity provider uh, as losing uh, the entirety of the assets you deposited into the pool uh, because everyone is going to sell those tokens which are uh, which price are dropping to zero to get the DAI which is stable and uh, even if you put 88 DAI you may end up with no DAI remaining uh, if a uh, lot of people sold a speculative asset uh, to your pool. So those are economic risk. Um, most like a lot of people are aware about it. But um, a lot of people are not aware of, about this risk. It's not to say that liquidity pools are, are bad. They're actually a really efficient uh, way to provide liquidity, uh, even for uh, people who are not uh, that uh, economically uh, knowledgeable. Uh, but uh, some specific uh, kind of pool are actually uh, risky. And I think this risk uh, should, be, uh, should be labeled. Um, another problem which can happen with uh, a market maker uh, is the problem of pass independence. So here uh, you can see pass independence in, um, uh, in, in the law of physics. So you assume you have some object uh, which is near like a planet, like say, uh, let's say the moon. Um, it goes from point A to B, no matter if it goes from pass one or pass two, the amount of energy that this uh, object uh, will have uh, will be the same. So you have something which is path independent. So if it goes from one point to another, no matter how it goes to this other point, uh, the, the, the state of this object will be the same. And that's what we want uh, in, a, in another financial system, uh, because if you don't have that, uh, you may end up having some uh, crypto economic hack. Uh, so you had this project, uh, which was called uh, Eminence, uh, which was not even officially released, but that was almost a secret version, uh, but people put quite a bit of money in it. Uh, and you could get some EMN token that you could then burn to get some E token. Um, the idea was that the amount, the price of the EMN token you could get would depend on the supply of the EMN token. So if people buy EMN token with DAI, the price of EMN on the market maker increase. Uh, if people burn EMN token uh, to get some other token, uh, the price uh, is gonna increase. So uh, what uh, what happened here? Oh, sorry, the price is gonna decrease if you burn the token. The price is gonna decrease if you burn the token because there are less supply. So what happened here? that you had someone uh, who bought a lot of this uh, EMN token. He used a part to get some uh, other token, some E token. Then he burned back the remaining of the EMN token. In this case, he got more DAI than what he paid for uh, because the supply of uh, EMN token was lower because he burned some part. Now with the E token he got, he burned the E token to get back some EMN. And then he used this EMN uh, to get back uh, the DAI. So the problem is that this system was not pass independent and by doing that, uh, he was able to uh, sell EMN token into the automatic market maker at a price which was higher than the price he had bought it. And by doing that multiple times, he ended up uh, uh, siphoning most uh, of, uh, of the liquidity uh, of this token and uh, getting away with uh, like a 15 million uh, amount uh, 50 million worth of fund. Uh, actually, he gave back uh, half of uh, of those um, to to the team uh, behind the project, still staying anonymous. So maybe he didn't want people to to be mad at him or to be to be chased. So he, he chose to maybe 7.5 million dollars is better than 15 million dollars and uh, a angry mob uh, against you. Uh, and there is also there was also the question of was this. Uh, legal or was this a hack, um, which is not that obvious. 
because it could be seen as some arbitrage opportunity, uh, which is just buy low and sell high. And if you have some contract which uh, allow you to which buy your asset at a price uh, lower than what he sold his asset to you, uh, well, maybe you're just a trader uh, or maybe you are exploiting uh, an economic mechanism for your own gain and it may be illegal. Uh, it's, know, it's not already obvious if it's good to be considered a hack or, uh, or an arbitrage. Um, this goes to uh, one actually quite interesting uh, tool, uh, which are uh, flash clones and atomic uh, transaction. So a flash loan is a zero second loan. Uh, it's atomic, which means that you're going to use uh, what you borrowed uh, in uh, one transaction. Uh, and you're going to you're going to do some operation, but the operation are linked to the loan. So the loan and the operation happen or nothing happen. And it doesn't require any collateral. So that can seem a bit crazy for people who are outside of the blockchain space. But in a few clicks here, I can borrow one billion dollar uh, with no collateral, uh, do a bunch of action, uh, but I need to reimburse this uh, one billion dollar uh, at the end of this action. Um, what is it used for? It's mainly used uh, for arbitrage opportunities. Uh, so you want to, you have an asset. Uh, which uh, is sold on the platform at a price uh, which is uh, lower than the price where another platform can buy it. Uh, so you're going to take this arbitrage opportunity. You're going to uh, loan some asset. You're going to buy it on the platform where the price is low and sell it on the platform the price is high. And in the same transaction, you reimburse uh, your loan. Um, it doesn't require any capital uh, because in traditional system, if you want to do arbitrage, you need to have capital to do these opportun uh, arbitrage opportunities. But here you, you can do one billion dollar like uh, arbitrage opportunity uh, with uh, ten dollars of transaction fees and uh, no capital required. Uh, you don't have any execution risk, so here it's like a decrease of risk compared to traditional system, uh, because in traditional system, if you want to take an arbitrage opportunity, uh, you buy low and you hope to be able to say I, because you cannot uh, execute this transaction in an atomic manner. If you buy on an exchange and you want to sell this asset on another exchange. You first need to get them back from one exchange and then sell them back onto another exchange. Uh, so there is some time in between, and between this time, the price may, may change. And you also have no counterparty risk uh, because if something goes wrong at any point, uh, the whole transaction is cancelled. So either everything works perfectly, or you will just lose the gas fee, and the gas fee are a few dollars even for crazy high uh, one billion dollar like uh, arbitrage opportunities. So Flashlon are actually a really good tool. Uh, they are making everything normally more safe, like it's making arbitrage super safe, super accessible, even without capital requirement. And it's a really interesting tool. But it's such an interesting tool that it can also allow uh, to um, uh, take some uh, sort of arbitrage opportunities or hacking. People may disagree on uh, if it's arbitrage or hacking uh, on uh, on some systems, and you had some example of people taking a huge loan, buying an asset, depositing this asset into a system uh, which uh, is going to credit you of a value proportional to the value of the asset you deposited. Uh, then uh, you uh, sell another part of the asset, so the price of the asset is going to be lower, and then you withdraw this asset. Uh, and uh, you would be uh, having your balance reduced less because at the time you withdraw the asset, the price of the asset is going to be lower compared to the, to the time where you deposited this asset. And you can repeat that uh, with a few cycles and you get yeah, and you get a few percent uh, each cycle and you are abusing the system which allows you to deposit and withdraw assets. So even with a flash loan, you could do it. But if you are to do it without a flash loan, uh, you will get the risk of other people interacting with the market uh, when you buy an asset to make this price increase, uh, while someone else could then sell, take, take advantage of it to sell you this asset uh, because uh, you are buying it at a price which is uh, higher than the real market price. Um, so this kind of attack would be hard to do if you didn't have flash loan. Right now, if you have flash loan, uh, you can do all of that uh, in an atomistic way and you don't need a capital. So a lot of attack, a lot of economic attacks 
are made uh, simpler, requiring less capital, and removing the risk because you can execute the attack uh, all at once. Or either all the attack work and you get some profit, or everything is cancelled and you just lose a few dollars of, uh, of gas. Uh, so even if it's not flash loan, which are really the problem, uh, that flash loan, a tool which is used to make good arbitrage, uh, take good arbitrage opportunities, can also be used uh, to, uh, to attack and, uh, and fool some systems. And again, uh, there is a, there may be a discussion about uh, whether uh, this is uh, actually an arbitrage or uh, an, an illegal attack. So this happened to, to this project, which was uh, Harvest Finance. And um, hackers end up with um, um, a, few, a, few million, uh, a few million dollars and they may give back 10%. They always end up with $24 million uh, by uh, doing this attack on uh, Harvest Finance. And it's still not obvious if uh, it's uh, arbitrage or, uh, or a hack. Um, another problem with flash loan would be governance attack. So we can take the example of the Maker system. Uh, so Maker is the system behind DAI, the stablecoin, uh, where people uh, holding uh, the MKR token can delegate to what is called AT. So the AT are the smart contract which uh, can, effect, can, uh, can do a bunch of different action. Uh, which can be uh, maintenance of the system, uh, improvement of the system, but you could also make uh, ads uh, which could do malicious actions. But normally, uh, if you uh, delegate to the ads, you have MKR, so you have some incentive into the system working because if the system doesn't work, your MKR are going to become uh, worthless. Uh, so that's a governance mechanism. But now what happens if you have a flash loan? Uh, if you have a flash loan and you can actually borrow MKR, so you can borrow a ton of MKR. Uh, you can delegate this MKR to a bad ad, which is going to execute a malicious action. You can execute the action. You can then uh, reimburse the loan, all of that into one atomic transaction. And the problem is that you have been able to execute an action, which requires a lot of MKR, but you have no skin in the game because you just reimburse your MKR in the same second. So you never took the risk of holding MKR while you are doing this bad action. So this happened, I uh, think, last week. Uh, fortunately, that was mostly done by, uh, I would say, white hackers uh, because they just whitelisted an address, uh, which is uh, not some, which not a malicious action to do, and they informed the team of the issue. And it's quite a hot topic right now uh, because uh, one of the most important stablecoin uh, may actually uh, be vulnerable with this kind of attack of uh, borrowing a lot of their governance token to uh, execute some uh, malicious uh, actions. Um, so it leads us to uh, potential risk uh, to system uh, which are uh, what we call the CDP, collateralized deposition. Uh, in crypto, generally people are anonymous. So when you want to borrow some asset, you almost always have to deposit some asset of uh, greater value uh, that they can sell in case you don't reimburse the load. Uh, and the idea of the system is that you can deposit assets, you can interest from this asset, and you can also borrow other assets. Uh, to borrow assets, uh, you obviously need to pay some interest. You can use it to get a short position. So you borrow an asset that you believe uh, is uh, overvalued. Uh, you sell it on the market, and uh, you expect that when the market uh, comes back uh, to a lower price, you're going to buy back the asset and then reimburse uh, your loan. So that's uh, a shorting mechanism. You can also use it for leverage. If you think an asset is going to uh, increase a lot, uh, you can uh, borrow. Uh, uh, you, can bor you can use this asset to borrow another asset that you're going to sell for the asset you think is going to increase. Uh, and uh, the asset you think is going to increase, you're going to, when it's after it has increased, you can sell it back to get the original asset to reimburse the loan. So this can allow you to take some leverage uh, if uh, you think the uh, price of a particular asset is going to increase a lot. Uh, so there's some nice financial tool. Uh, you can also borrow um, assets to use them um, in governance, for example, but in any use you, you may want. Um, and if 
the asset uh, value of the assets you borrowed uh, are uh, too too low uh, compared to uh, are, too, sorry, are too high compared to the assets you, you deposited. Uh, you have what we call is the liquidation, where the system is gonna sell your deposit uh, to be sure uh, it's not you're not gonna end up with having. Uh, more asset borrowed than deposited. Because if you have more asset borrowed than deposited, well, you can just never uh, reimburse uh, uh, the loan. And there is no identity, so there is no one which is going to bother you if you don't reimburse your loan. Um, if this happens, you have deposits which are auctioned, uh, and uh, people uh, can, can buy those assets uh, to actually reimburse uh, your loan for you. Uh, you have the market risk. So if you deposit uh, some assets, and the price of this asset drops really fast before uh, the system has time to uh, auction your, your uh, collateral. Uh, the system may end up with uh, people having uh, borrowed value uh, greater than deposit value. So in this case, you have some system debt, and generally system debt have to be reimbursed uh, by uh, people holding token of the specific platform. So this can happen once in a while. Uh, some um, particular token holder get uh, some interest in exchange of uh, having to uh, insure from uh, market risk where asset can can crash too fast. Uh, but you also have other sort of risk uh, that we have the counterparty risk. So if you have an asset that you can use as a collateral in the deposit, uh, which is governed uh, by a malicious actor, uh, those actor could uh, for example, make it worthless or mint a lot of those assets. Uh, it, the same thing can happen in case of smart contract failure. And here we are not speaking about the smart contract failure of the platforms. Uh, we are speaking about smart contract failure of assets which can be deposited and used as collateral on those platforms. And there are way more of those assets, obviously, than, uh, than platforms. So you can have uh, uh, those risks which are not just in the platform, but it, which are in the asset which are allowed to be used uh, in the platform. And in the worst case, uh, if one of the assets is compromised, uh, someone could uh, mint a really high amount of those assets, deposit it on the platform, and borrow everything else on the platform. And a few seconds later, the price of the asset will drop to zero because people will notice the asset has been attacked, uh, but then you could have uh, extracted uh, all uh, the available value on this platform, and the value on this platform is in the order of uh, of one billion. Uh, so that's definitely uh, a huge bounty uh, for uh, for attackers there. Some systems have, have limits of how much of the specific assets you can use as collateral, like Maker, but some other uh, uh, haven't. Uh, other risk with uh, those collateralized deposition system uh, is uh, liquidation risk. Uh, the risk can be that no one buys this asset. Uh, so it actually happened with Maker, uh, where their auction system was not really user-friendly. Uh, actually, you did not even have any user interface to buy the asset which were auctioned. Uh, it was only uh, some, uh, some bots which were programmed to buy those assets. But uh, when uh, those bots uh, ran out of money or did not manage to buy in time, you ended up to having some collateral sold at zero, that was an auction, and the best bid was zero. So some actor ended up getting a lot of assets, uh, millions of dollars worth of assets uh, for free uh, because no one else bid. And obviously uh, that means that people who deposited assets and were liquidated ended up getting nothing because normally if you're liquidated, uh, you still get uh, what your assets are auctioned for uh, minus uh, minus your debt, obviously, uh, but here they did not get anything. Uh, and that also led to uh, a debt in the system, uh, which had to be uh, repaid by people uh, holding token of the system. Um, another problem which can happen is the Oracle risk, uh, because to uh, start the liquidation, you need uh, to know the price of the asset and see that the ratio of the value of borrowed asset uh, compared to the collateral is too high. Uh, but now, if you have a malfunction in an Oracle, uh, they may end up liquidating some assets which shouldn't be liquidated, or not liquidating some assets which should be liquidated, uh, and that's obviously uh, some, uh, some huge problem. And that can be even more problematic 
uh, when uh, getting good price feed are uh, problematic uh, because you have some exchange uh, which are going to do what we call wash trading, uh, where they just buy and sell the same assets into their own platform to make people think they have volume while actually they don't have. And uh, this can uh, uh, bias uh, the actual uh, reported price. So here you can see, uh, I even took the PNK, so the token of the project I'm on. Uh, you can see on uh, the left side uh, the price which are reported uh, by the two major uh, uh, price uh, reporting websites, CoinMarketCap and CoinGecko. Uh, and uh, you can see here you have a few, it goes down, it goes up, we don't really know why. So there's probably some exchange which is reporting uh, uh, really bad numbers. Here you also see really bad number being reported. Uh, while if you look at the real price, the price you will have on a, on a DEX, on a non exchange, uh, it's, there is some significant discrepancies uh, between what was the real price and the price which was reported uh, by platform reporting prices. Um, so that's also another risk, the Oracle risk. Mm, now, what, what do we do when we have some risky system and we combine them together? Uh, do we get a less risky system or a more risky system? Um, it depends, actually. Uh, Sometimes, uh, for example, if you combine three oracles uh, and you take uh, three price oracles and you take the median value, uh, this is going to be uh, more resilient uh, than uh, only taking one. So you need to have two out of three of the oracles which malfunction uh, to have a problem uh, instead of just one out of one. So sometimes it increases uh, the security, uh, but sometimes it also decreases the security uh, because any uh, failure in the stack uh, can lead uh, to a failure in everything which is upper in the stack. So here, if you have like your head like Kyber, if you have everything else, if you have Kyber failing, you have everything else in this stack, uh, which is also going to be failing. Uh, you also have the problem of uh, getting extra complexity uh, of system interacting with each other, and people may while developing system. Uh, which are interacting with other systems tend to have lower knowledge of the systems they are interacting with compared to the systems they are developing themselves. And that can sometimes lead, lead to some bugs, uh, which are uh, interaction bugs, like systems taken separately, they don't have any problem, but when they interact together, uh, they can have some, uh, some vulnerabilities. Uh, of course, composability is really interesting because it allows people to build uh, protocols on top of the other protocol and to do that in a permissionless manner. So you don't even need to, to ask permission. Like if you want to build something with Kleros, if you want to build something with, uh, with DAI Maker, uh, you don't need to go to see the Maker Foundation or the Kleros Cooperative to say, hey, can I, can I build something using you? No, uh, you, you, you just build it. Uh, so these, are, these have really good advantages, but also uh, extra complexity risk, which can happen. Um, Previous part of the of the talk was mostly on risk because that, that's the subject of my talk. Uh, but uh, you should not conclude uh, that the blockchain is uh, particularly risky compared to other system, uh, and that everything uh, uh, is wide west and should be regulated. That's not that's not the point at all. Uh, I'm just explaining risk because that, that's the talk. Um, for example, if you look at um, exchanges act, so uh, money stolen from exchange in 2019. You had $33 million to learn from centralized exchanges. And on the centralized exchanges, I haven't been able to find any report of money stolen. So there may have been some, but they are probably so, so negligible that it didn't make the news. And those kind of exchanges tend to have the same kind of volume. So here, uh, you have blockchain system, like decentralized exchanges, uh, which are working way better and are way more secure uh, than the alternative of uh, using centralized exchanges. Uh, also, uh, we should, some, some mistake which is often made is to say, oh, look at all those acts, all this crypto money is stolen, but a lot of times crypto money is stolen from centralized exchanges, which are actually handling crypto money, uh, but in a non-blockchain manner. They are ending leak with uh, like, like classic accounting uh, and uh, classic key management, uh, which is actually less secure than doing it uh, on decentralized exchanges. Uh, so that's crypto money stolen, but that's not crypto money stolen because of blockchain. That's crypto money stolen because of people uh, using uh, uh, bad non-blockchain related tools. Uh, also a good advantage is that you have way more transparency. 
if you have a centralized exchange act, it can take time uh, you, before people are aware of it. And people may still put money on it while it has been already hacked. Uh, you had some exchange uh, which has been running for around two years uh, while it was continue, continuously hacked during those two years. Now, if you are on a DEX, on a decentralized exchange, and the exchange is hacked, um, that's that's in immediately. And anyone can look at the chain and see that it has been hacked and want people and no one is going to use it uh, until it's fixed. Or perhaps no one is going to use it forever if people uh, have uh, lost uh, faith in it. So crypto, uh, even if uh, it's executing code as written, sometimes without uh, really uh, doing a, a second lecture of this code, uh, is also um, a mechanism bringing a lot of transparency and uh, cutting the losses uh, fast because if something goes wrong, people are aware of it. Uh, you also have the recoveries, uh, which are made by crypto system. So we spoke about the DAO hack uh, at the beginning of the talk. Uh, that was the time where I would say we were like in the training wheels. So the chain was forked to uh, to fix this hack and it's unlikely to happen again, but you can see that it still happened on a uh, new system. Uh, which are uh, not that mature and probably less secure, but you can you can sometimes fix stuff. And we also have another example with Team Hive, where it was a, a blogging platform uh, which was uh, uh, unfortunately had its control taken uh, by some um, bad actors, which control most of the token, most of the shares of the platform, uh, and the user uh, they just say, "Oh, that, that's bad. We're just gonna fork it." They so they copied the they copied the code, they copied the balance, they removed the balance of the malicious uh, user, which were have taken control of the governments, uh, and they created a, a, a copy of the platform uh, which suffered this attack. So this is a kind of uh, recovery that you would not get in the classical space. Like if in classical space you have uh, most of the share of a company uh, which are owned by people doing bad thing, uh, well that's gonna stay away. You can you cannot have like the employee which say oh we. We, we may we make a copy and we remove uh, the bad governance uh, of the company. Uh, that's something which cannot happen, which which can happen in decentralized system. Um, so that was uh, for the talk. Uh, now we're going to go to question and debate, and a few points that are to be debated. Uh, it is uh, code is law is like is a code on a smart contract be considered as a law or at least as a contract. Uh, or uh, yes, no, or only on some chain. For example, people who are using ETC uh, are specifically using a chain where code is low. So we may argue that maybe in this case, we should consider code is low, but not the case of, uh, of chain, which does not have this philosophy. Uh, I gave a few examples of economic acts. Uh, are those like malicious acts? Is it something uh, which should be forbidden by the law? Is it just some arbitrage opportunities? Uh, is it some illegal price manipulation? Uh, are you allowed to bid zero on auction and get million dollars for free? Um, so I would say on that probably. On price manipulation, I don't know. On arbitrage, I would say it's probably legal. Uh, price manipulation, that's a bit more fuzzy. Uh, but other people may have different opinion on that and may play, put the, the bar at a different place than I will do. Um, what about malicious governance? Uh, is it legal? In this case, probably yes, because in classical system, it tends to be legal even to, to govern badly a company. Uh, and is forking bad actor uh, also legal? I would probably say yes, uh, because that's free to copy. Um, but I let's hear for uh, let some time for questions and uh, for debates of uh, the participants. Uh, thank you, and uh, let's start uh, question and debates. Do you want that I uh, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, so I would like to thank you again uh, for your presentation, Clemmer. It was very, very interesting, but very dense. So we we learn a lot of things around your uh, your talk. So I'm going to first to ask if there are some participants who want to to ask something to looking at the technological uh, risk or to the economic risk. 
Is there someone who has some question? In that case, I can uh, open the, uh, the tune. No? So, um, so I, I just want to, Clement, to begin the question, perhaps other will arrive later. But, um, you know, this is a right text, so your, your presentation is very good for that, because you introduce the, the principle and then you try to illustrate by code uh, to, to, to try to show uh, how it can work. Uh, the first remark I want to, to do, it, it is a remark or a question. So tell me, I am not as specialist as you for what you describe. So I just need to have some, uh, some precision look at, looking at your talk and perhaps other uh, participants can also ask questions around that. When you present uh, most of, of your, of the risk that the technological risk, mainly first to the DAO, concern the use of Ethereum. Is it true or not? Oh, so I'm obviously biased because I'm building an SRM, so I'm obviously speaking about what I know. Uh, you will also have that in uh, other platforms, but other platforms often also use the EVM, so they use the same smart contract mechanism, so that would be applicable to them too. You also have other platforms uh, which are using other sort of language, uh, which can be more or less ex expressive. Uh, for example, on Bitcoin, you, you still have some sort of language, but it's uh, really basic and it's, it has really low uh, expressivity. So it's really it's pretty hard to, to have bugs because you cannot do much. So it's hard to, to mess up when you have just a few options at your disposal. Um, but that would be applicable to, I would say, all platform uh, with uh, complex smart contracts. Okay, but nevertheless, uh, inside the community, the, the most of the smart contracts are developed using Ethereum. Yeah, as Jerome said, like, it's not a BS, it's a reality. Yeah, like uh, most of the DeFi, uh, almost all the DeFi is happening on Ethereum. They may have a few DeFi on the chain, but it is almost negligible compared to what is happening on, on Ethereum, yeah. Okay. Okay, so now if I come back to your first question, code is low, yes or not? Uh, what can we say to the users who want to, to develop smart contract concerning the, I, for the moment today, the legislation around this problem of code is low? Does, does we restrict to the fact that the code is low is only uh, true when it is uh, inside the the code by itself. This means inside the contract. Or do we have another possibility to try to to answer to this very 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 important question? Is it clear? So uh, yeah, like for for the for the contract, the code is already low for the contract. Uh, Except in really uh, specific case, like when during the DAO hack where you had the chain being forked. But I think it's something which happened more because it was early stage and with like training wheels. But I don't expect uh, this kind of fork to happen again, at least on, uh, on large chains. So code is low would actually be uh, at least in the, in the contract, uh, which may be in the chain, but it will not prevent, for example, uh, prosecution of uh, someone uh, hacking and stealing the money, for example. That may be another question. And okay. I think most jurisdictions will actually consider that uh, from the legal perspective, code is not low and uh, someone stealing the money from the contract uh, could face uh, legal repercussions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I, I see that uh, someone, uh, Roxana, Voiceu has a question. Can you open your uh, and, and ask to your question? Okay, please? so how can we integrate efficiently the two portfolio, one governed by smart contract and the non-virtual asset one? Uh, I don't think they are really, you can really integrate them 
And because they cannot interact with each other uh, without going through a centralized actor, so generally centralized exchange. So I spoke about uh, decentralized exchanges, uh, but they are mainly for a transaction within the chain. Uh, now, if you want to uh, exchange some classic asset uh, to a blockchain asset, you will probably go through uh, some exchange. Uh, and on the exchange, uh, it's not uh, on, it's not just a integration. It's not just a technical integration. You have people uh, in the background running the exchange, so it's not that easy to integrate uh, classic assets. Uh, like uh, of your portfolio with uh, smart contract ones. What you can have is tokenization. Uh, for example, you will have USDT, where it's a tokenized uh, dollar, where you have a company uh, which is uh, getting dollar on their bank account and they are putting some token, which is a representation of this dollar. And you should normally be able to redeem this token uh, to the dollar. Uh, I think we also heard about uh, some people at the European level speaking about making a digital euro. So in this case, you could have a digital euro, uh, which uh, can uh, be on, on the blockchain or on Ethereum or other blockchains, and in this case, be governed by smart contracts. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there someone who wants to ask any question? We have uh, some time for that. Okay, so um, now I, I have another qu question, uh, Clément, concerning the governance, the malicious governance. Uh, you, you speak about that mainly for the economic risk, but it, for me, it can also be uh, say something concerning the governance when we you have, uh, for instance, the fact of the, pro the problem of the privacy when you write a, a contract. Because uh, as you mentioned, uh, everything is public because we, we use a public blockchain, isn't it? So, yeah. the, question, so the question is, uh, I think we have, can you, I think you say some words on that, but can you um, give more precision about the fact that uh, how we can avoid uh, the loss of privacy when uh, people uh, want to use a smart contract? So, in, you, like in some way, it's more private. In another way, it's less private. Uh, so everything which uh, happened on the chain uh, can be read by anyone. So everyone knows what which account does. However, uh, most of the people uh, don't know who is behind which account. So you can have the first privacy uh, by avoiding a link to your account. Uh, between your identity and this account because someone can make the link, they can know everything you can do uh, online, uh, at least economically on the chain. Uh, you also have some techniques uh, which can be used uh, to kind of like uh, blur uh, the trace of uh, what you are doing uh, with your account. Uh, so you have some blockchain specific for that. You have uh, Zcash, uh, which is a specific blockchain where you cannot uh, see what are the actions taken by all the accounts. And you also have application, uh, so on Ethereum, that would be a Tornado Cash, uh, which would allow you... Uh, Excuse me, Clement, can you specify for the participant that to, to what blockchain you have in mind for that? Oh, Zcash, we have Zcash, which is a blockchain okay. with a private transaction. Okay. Uh, on um, Ethereum, you have Tornado Cash, which could okay. allow you to make some uh, private transfer, uh, but all of those um, tends to be limited to only making transfers, like more complex operations, like providing liquidity, uh, they tend to uh, always uh, be uh, accessible by anyone which can read the chain. Okay, and also concerning the another side of the governance, when uh, you want to to develop uh, the user protection, uh, you you show that we can uh, add in the contract some specific function to 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 have this uh, possibility to to protect the the user. Can you say something uh, about we, the we, function? We, which kind of protection is it for governance? I, I don't really get the, the question. No, you know when we we consider. When you uh, when you 
use a smart contract if you want to protect the user from malicious uh, action, you specify at a certain time that we can use inside the contract specific function for that. Oh, I think I may have given an example for a particular vulnerability, uh, but there is no like magic function which is going to solve everything. Uh, it's different sort of vulnerabilities can have different sort of uh, technical answers. Uh, but there is no like one size fit all function which is going to protect the user. Okay. But most of the contracts, they don't have the vulnerability. Most of the contracts are not vulnerable to attacks. It's just that sometimes developers make, make mistakes and uh, attackers can exploit those mistakes uh, to, to steal funds. So yeah. it's not like a generic problem which uh, then have a, a solution. Uh, it's not like with Windows, for example, if you use Windows, you may have a lot of attacks which can happen, and then you put a firewall which is going to protect against some sort of attack. Um, this is not really how smart contract security is working. It's more you you should create a contract uh, which shouldn't allow this attack in the first place. Okay. Okay. So. Uh... Uh, for me, I have an, uh, a last question, which is just for you. You just, um, I think you tried to say something on that, but not today. Um, we speak about uh, public blockchain. This is clear. What's happen if we, in the future, we will have uh, the CBDC, you know, the centralized uh, uh, currency developed by a central bank. Uh, do you think that we can have also smart contract developed inside in, in that uh, framework? Uh, yeah, I think that may actually be the only use uh, because, like, if you make a blockchain which is centralized, uh, you may end up getting uh, the disadvantage of both worlds, of both having a complex system uh, and uh, having this centralized point of failure, which is the entity handling the blockchain. Uh, but making private blockchain make, make sense uh, in the way where you could reuse all the smart contract tools which have been developed uh, on public ones. So you could make a, a, like a CBDC blockchain uh, to be able to take advantage of uh, all the smart contracts which are uh, developed uh, for, for public blockchain, smart contract and smart contract tools uh, developed for public blockchain, yeah. Okay. So I think this you would probably also good. want to have uh, bridges uh, to allow this blockchain to communicate with public yeah. blockchains. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is uh, this conclusion could be interesting for also the regulation and the, uh, the, the institution uh, will try to to integrate the digital inside their environment. I think it is very interesting. Uh, so in case of have... private blockchain, I think you may have, uh, you may often fork or use some sort of mechanism uh, to revert hacking, uh, yeah. because you may, in this case, since you have this party, this party doesn't need to be neutral, or you could also have this party being neutral. It's a choice yeah. which can be made, which Cannot really be done with uh, with public blockchain, but it also uh, leads to some risk for the user, uh, which uh, can fear uh, that um, the entities uh, handling this uh, uh, this private blockchain uh, would uh, act against them. So, for example, um, they could uh, freeze funds uh, illegally. So you can sometimes see banks uh, which are freezing funds or uh, forbidding people to open an account uh, while uh, there are no specific legal reasons to do that. Like especially if you work in the blockchain sector uh, and you go and you try to open a bank account, you see while well, all the banks, they don't want to open your account. You have to go to, to Bank de France to, to force a bank uh, to open your account. No. So centralized blockchain may also have additional accessibility issue uh, if uh, they are heavily regulated and you have some people who are able to exclude participants. Okay. So okay. There, is, there is no free lunch. Like, uh, yeah. there may be some advantage or some disadvantage. Uh, that's where you, uh, that, that, do you think it's more advantage or more disadvantage? 
and that what user or government developing uh, the chain uh, may have to to wait.